Very good. So, um, appreciate uh, all the excellent questions that came up uh, during that, that uh, talk. I thought many of them touched on um, very important broader issues um, within uh, modeling about uh, level of detail that's sought for model given the research questions that uh, are underway, different uh, different motivations for representing or omitting factors, and the whole issue of uh, to what degree things are hard coded, to what degree you you seek to, to to secure them as emergent properties uh, of the model. That is, to what degree they're endogenously produced by the model, and can therefore be explained by the model, and therefore uh, secure a more more general general model that sort of gives rise to them automatically. And to what degree you impose them on the model. And suffice to say that. You know, models are typically part of an ecosystem where um, we'll uh, approximate to different, or different levels of detail and different degrees of, of, uh, of detail um, the, uh, the underlying situation. Sometimes you may, be, you may find that a model suffices that has more approximations for certain things are hard coded, and other times you want models which seek to explain those things by by generating them automatically, which may afford you much more flexibility in examining uh, a broader set of interventions, uh, for example. Um, so, for example, in many models, uh, we may view contact between individuals as a primal thing, as something that occurs with certain rates, and where we put those rates in so that we can do calculations of how quickly an infection will spread or how many how many um, infections can be averted through vaccination, um, uh, understand the, uh, the cost effectiveness of an investment in some, um, in some uh, vaccination decision or provision of antivirals or, or what have you. In other cases, we may want to view contact as an emergent, the contact rates we see empirically as emergent properties of um, people's uh, choices, perhaps risk perception, for example, um, perhaps mobility patterns, which, um, uh, which are more underlying quantities. And by representing more of these details that give rise to the observed data, say, say contact, we have then great fle greater flexibility in terms of the interventions we might look at. So we might look at interventions which affect mobility patterns in which therefore lower contact rates. Or we might look at interventions which affect risk perception, um, and and therefore uh, impact impact uh, contact pattern rates because of that. So sometimes our models are more aggregate and hard code certain things, and sometimes they seek to represent things in more detail. The model you just saw um, is seeking to explain, to give rise, to generate a number of patterns that that are, are um, at a higher level and might have been just hard-coded into a, a higher level model. So Cheryl was mentioned, for example, that we do have this, um, uh, this more aggregate model. And uh, the aggregate model was such that we couldn't easily understand the concentrations of prions that occur in certain key thoroughfares or certain key locations like Lakeside. And because it couldn't really um, recognize those concentrations, it was hard to do the environment to individual transmission components of it. It was hard to recognize the levels of, of risk associated with that without doing a spatially disaggregated model. Um, similarly, while we put contact rates in as sort of um, fixed rates on a per season basis within the, um, within the more aggregate model, uh, it's possible that some interventions could affect contact rates by artful placement of food sources or by um, by change of, by uh, fencing or what have you in a way that really wouldn't be captured by a model that hard codes them. You know, we might we might instead look at a level of capturing mobility patterns where the contacts are emergent, like they were in the model we just saw. So wind chill back here in the back, for example. Um, has been doing quite a bit of, of work with models of uh, individuals' mobility 
and that mobility can then drive, can drive contact rates. The tricky thing there, as you saw, is often that um, uh, it, it can be hard to capture the collective behaviors, the collective correlations and movements between sets of individuals um, uh, effectively using a set of rules and a set of, uh, a set of heuristics uh, from an individual level. So people interact in ways that exhibit a great number of, of correlations, uh, a great number of, uh, of uh, collective patterns that, that are, are emergent from a diversity of rules operating at the individual level. And teasing out those rules effectively is challenging. Alex Mayer, who was here just a minute, a few minutes ago, is over in the corner. He's going to be talking uh, tomorrow about an approach that uses uh, random utility theory to more formally model decision making on the part of an individual in a way that might take into account a set of choices. This is a technique used um, by uh, choice scientists. Um, to, to characterize individual behavior in, in a number of domains, one of them being uh, transportation behavior, another being marketing, response to marketing. And it is a framework which affords sufficient um, generality to take into account both heuristics and, and more sort of uh, uh, reflective types of decision making. Um, and uh, really when it comes to trying to capture individual behavior and how that behavior will change in response to interventions. Sometimes spending a bit of extra time kind of characterized or driving that or how that behavior is made or how that how the decisions are made within those models can lead to uh, can lead to greater robustness in terms of anticipating how the situation would change in the event we have interventions in place. So, so this whole issue of how much detail goes into a model, one of the factors that, that informs that is, uh, is the, uh, which interventions you're trying to, to simulate, if, if any. It also, of course, bears on what, you're, what patterns you're trying to explain, what data you have at your disposal or understanding you have at your disposal. We'll be revisiting some of these issues that were brought up there in the context of our lecture on calibration. Where we talk about parameterization of models and calibration. Where calibration is is trying to uh, trying to choose model parameters such that the model uh, and model rules such that the model behavior, uh, the emergent model behavior reproduces certain data that we have. Where that data is typically of such a form that it it's the result of such a broad set of factors in the model we can't just plug it into the model directly. Instead, we seek to explain it using the model. So uh, we'll be we'll be coming back to that issue um, issue tomorrow. Okay. Um, so I have a uh, of a hard uh, choice to make. We um, we had one more topic I wasn't able to cover this morning, and either I'm going to do it tomorrow morning, or um, or, or we can do probably about half an hour on it right now. And it has to do with capturing these mobility, making agents move in space. How many people would like to do that right now, sort of on the breadth of this? Okay. Um, and how many people would, would infer, prefer instead to go right into the projects and do that, um, do that tomorrow morning instead, do the mobility tomorrow morning? Okay. Okay. Um, so the eyes have it, I guess. Uh, okay. So we're gonna do do a very quick uh, look at the issue of mobility. How do we capture this sort of mobility within these, uh, within these models? Bearing in mind that, that in many models, mobility may drive contacts. Mobility may drive contacts that bear on agent behavior, that bear on transmission of pathogen, et cetera. So, so let's take a look at agent mobility in 2D landscapes. Um, I had mentioned before lunch that um, there's a, uh, a large number of models where um, agents are, excuse me, um, uh, where agents are situated in space um, and uh, where uh, those situated agents undergo some dynamics 
well, safety. So we've seen this for quite a few of our models. Most of our models have had agents scattered in space, and those agents have undergone various processes. Infection processes from neighbors in a network, infection processes from neighbors in space. Um, uh, we just saw it in the case of pregnancy and delivery. Um, these are aspects of agent evolution for stationary agents. And certainly we have this whole technique known as cellular automata, where agents evolve in a grid um, over time, like the very first models that we saw. Um, however, um, uh, AnyLogic provides us with the opportunities for securing mobility of agents as well within a 2D spatial context. And there's two types of, of uh, context that we have to deal with here. One is uh, continuous embedding, um, and one is where we have this discretization of space, discrete cells. So the continuous embedding is, is more similar to what you just saw in that model. Um, so uh, the wandering elephants model, which is including with any logic, also illustrates this. So here, there's no physical exclusion. Two agents can pass in space, and there's no collision. There's no automatic collision between them. And any logic doesn't automatically detect, you know, that they're they're um, that they're colliding and prevent them from overlapping. Here, agents are assumed to be very small, so they can pass each other without problems. By contrast, with discrete cells. Um, here you divide into columns and rows, and there's only one or zero agents in a given cell at a given, a given time. Okay, so in the top level, agents move in a certain direction with some speed, whereas the bottom one, agents move continuously or discontinuously from cell to cell. They can kind of move to neighbor cells, or they can jump in a discontinuous fashion, in a non-local fashion, from one cell to the other. So they can move. The, like the shelling segregation model built into any logic for those who are interested in looking at it. We're going to be focusing on the top of these. Agents moving in a direction with some speed. Okay. Now, in continuous space, there's a set of methods that we can use, a set of, um, of these calls that we can make that any logic provides us. Some of them are familiar to us. Like yesterday, we saw get x and get y. Where did we see those? Get x and y. Get it y. Where did we see that yesterday? Connections between people. Remember that line? Um, but we, we have some as well. We can have ask, is moving? Is an agent moving? We can get their target X and target Y. Where are they heading to? We can ask for their rotation. And, and then we can, we can control them in certain ways. We could say move them to X, Y. In other words, initiate agent movement towards that location. We can set their velocity. We can set their X and Y location. Um, we can jump them to a new location and we can set their rotation. So I'd like to create a new project called um, Ingloriously Movement Towards Mouse. Um, so so uh, this will be a, a new model. There's actually a much more extensive example on this in the sample uh, um, exercises that I provide. So if you do new model here, and we'll create a model called Movement Towards Mouse ABMB 2013. Okay. Um, so, and, and this one we're also creating it from scratch. I like to teach my students how to how to build these up so they know what's what's involved. Um, helps eliminate the magic associated with it. Okay. Um, so we're going to add, okay, well, you're going to tell me how to do this. So how are we going to add uh, an agent class? Relentless drilling in the boot camp. This is kind of the equivalent of saying, soldier, do 30 push-ups for me now. How do we add an agent class? Okay, okay, add new active object class. Um, okay, and we're going to call it uh, you, I'm going to call a person, but we could call it any, any, anything we want. What do I call it in here? I call it a person. Okay, so, so you can call it whatever you, you'd like to. If you want to call it a DR, you can. Um, okay, so that's step one. What's step two? Make it an agent. And we can do that in the properties of it that sit before us. Okay, so uh, having done that, it will 
change in a, to, to resemble the Da Vincian symbol. Okay, um, so once it's uh, once it's uh, it's uh, created, we're going to add a representation to it, a visual representation. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll show you what can go wrong if you don't do this. Um, uh, I'm going to ad lib a little bit um, here. So okay, suppose we want to create a population of these agents before we add their, their visual representation. How do we create a representation? How do we create a, a population of agents? First of all, where does it live? In Maine. Okay, and, and how do I create that population? Sorry? How do, how do I create a population of agents in Maine? Sorry? Yeah, how do I create an agent population? Drag it onto Maine, right? And let's call it I'm calling it population, but there's nothing privileged about that. I could call it pop, I could call it group, or whatever, right? Um, sure. What's the difference between doing that and adding agent population from the general? Okay, it's a good question. Agent population from the general, um, it allows you to, to quickly do a bunch of other common tasks, like add an environment. It can actually create the class for you, so you don't have to manually create it. It can um, set some other properties, like the initial the initial size of that population, um, and so it can do. This is a great way of doing it. I think after you've learned exactly what's going on, but it's good to to just know what are the manual steps you'd have to do, you know, to uh, to, to sort of reproduce that same behavior. This is just sort of a a um, collection of the normal steps and you can choose to do more of them or fewer of them if, if you wish to. What we're doing here is sort of a more uh, detailed look at, at the step-by-step the -step components because sometimes when something goes wrong students who have just used wizards or, or broader um, actions they don't know how to, how to fix it. You know, Too many things come along with it and they don't know which is why they need to use one or the other etc. So, but you could use agent population that's a good one. Okay. So, so now we have a population. Now let's suppose we want to add a appearance for this agent. Suppose we want to make the agent, oh, what the heck, let's make it a, um, let's do something other than an oval this time. We've, we've dealt with too many ovals. So um, what, what do you want to make it besides an oval? Um, do you want to make it a, like a, a fighter jet um, or a lorry or a forklift? Um, so. So you can go down to uh, to pictures here um, uh, if 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 you'd like to. Um, but a lot of them don't afford the flexibility in terms of coloring and so on. Maybe we'll make it a a rectangle. Just, okay. So let's let's drag over a rectangle um, there. Let's make it a square. And um, what's that? Okay. So we're gonna make it a square here. Boom. We're going to center it on, on the origin. Okay, so I just made it a square. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so so uh, now we could go back to um, to to Maine. Um, now let me ask this: If I want to lay these things out, um, uh, well, okay, it, it's best to learn these things by doing. So this population that we have created. Is it a population yet? What do we have to do to make it a population? Okay, it, it, it is nice to do the environment. But the environment's actually needed if we if we need to show them distributed in space. Something to do with an, uh, a spatial location or a or a um, uh, or a, a, a connectivity topology. Um, but there's something we need to do to make it contain a, a real population. Does anyone remember? We have to click replicated and say how many. Let's say, um, what do I say in my, um, in my, my thing here? Um, I think uh, a replicated object, we'll just make it size one right now. It's replicated and there's only one person in it. One person in the population, okay? So it's a population of size one. Hmm? Now let's suppose I were to run the model as it is. What do you think I'd see? The answer is, ladies and gentlemen, I see nothing uh, about the, the agents. Why not? Well, it's because we actually created the, 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 the unfortunate truth 
The difficult truth is here that we created the presentation for person after we dragged it in and made it a population. That's an awkward thing. Now, it used to be much more of a pain, but now any logic provides this create, create presentation button. So if you just click that, if you go to the population, who needs a TA? Who needs a TA? Okay. Um, so we're going to do create presentation. And now it recognizes, oh, the person's a square, and, and it's going to give them an appearance. So now let's run the model again. And, uh, and then we have a square here. Okay. Um, but we still haven't... We still haven't had an environment that's going to distribute us in space. So how are we going to add an environment, folks? Let's rehearse these basic tasks, one of the most basic tasks. So how are we going to add in, how are we going to associate this population with an environment that will lay it out? People? Sorry? OK, general, yeah. Um, you know. In this case, we don't actually don't even need one, but sure, let's go add an environment. That's fine. Um, we'll, we'll start the person in a random location. Okay, so we'll add an environment in. Fine. And so we added an environment. What else do we need to do? Go back to population. Yep. And go to environment and click and type environment, the name of the environment. So if we had called the new environment env, we would have to say env here. Right? Oh. Oh gosh. Um, okay. Um, okay. So um, now let's let's go run the model. What do you expect to see now? What will be different? Okay. Now the person is going to be located at different places. There's still only one person, but sometimes they're at one place. Sometimes they're at another place. Okay. So they're at, at some random location. That's good. Why is that? Because by default, they're laid out to be at a random location by the environment. OK? So that's good. Um, OK, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to add a visual element into main. Into main, OK? Um, so specifically, I'd like to add in into main a rectangle. Okay? So I'd like to add a big rectangle into main. Sort of like like this. Um, and and we're going to send it to the back so it's behind the agents. So let's let's pull down to go look at presentation and we'll put a rectangle in here and we'll um, We'll go take this rectangle, drag it to the right, and then we'll say order send to back. Okay? Okay? So we put a big rectangle in there. It looks something like this. Um, so I'll, I'll just enlarge it. It looks something like that. I'm not particular about how big it is. You can make it bigger if you want to. Boom. Okay? Okay. Okay, so I'm just closing this. Boom. Okay. Good. So so we've just added a rectangle and we sent it to the back. We right clicked on it, said send to back and uh okay. So folks, what I did there, I'm trying to do it so if I click somewhere, I can record where I click, anywhere in the background. Where would I go to, so now I've got this rectangle in the background, where would I go to handle a click event? When I click on it, I want to handle that. Where would I go? Dynamic of the, okay, of the what in main? Of the, of the rectangle, the rectangle. Okay, um, so here we, on the on click event here, I'm gonna insert a bit of code here, and it's going to say move to. I wanna move the first part person in the population to where I'm clicking, okay? 
Okay. Now, fortunately, you now try to unpack that. Um, so I'll just observe. There's a little light bulb next to it, to the on click. What does that light bulb say? Someone tell me. What does that light bulb say? Okay. Yeah. And what what is the idea that it has? So if you hover over the the if you hover over this, it says use click x click y, the coordinates of the click relative to the shape. Okay. Um, so, so in other words, automatically we're going to have provided to us the location of, that was clicked here as click X, click Y. So suppose I want to move the person, the, the, the first person in the population to here. How would I do that? I want to move the first person in the population towards this point. How would I do that? I want to send them in this direction, get them moving. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Okay. So the question is, how do we get them? So if I want to, I'm going to give you a hint. The first person in the population. So who would I ask who the first person in the population is? Given all these things, would I ask the environment? Would I ask the rectangle who the first person in the population is? Or would I ask the population who the first person in the population is. Okay, so let's direct our question to the population. Now, normally I'd be didactic and I'd say this stuff population implying that population is part of me. And, and then I could press control space and you'll find there's a thing called get, okay? So I could get the very first person in the population. And then I wanna say, move to this point, click X, click Y. So I could go see what supported there, and there's a thing called move to. So we'll do click X comma click Y, okay? Okay, um, so, so this is the code here that I put. So I'm saying, hey, for me, get my population, ask the population who the first person is in it, and that person, so this is a reference to me. I ask this the population. That's a reference to the population. I ask, get it, this, the first person in it. It returns a reference to the first person. I say, first person, move to this location. And then it moves to that place. Mm -hmm. Click X, click Y. Okay? Um, and if we go and we build here, it's going to want a semicolon after this. So. Um, in, in Java, semicolons uh, need to terminate uh, a statement like this. In other words, they're needed to sort of say, okay, it's, it, uh, we're done with the statement now. Um, and so we need a semicolon after this, like, like the, oops, sorry, oh, like that, semicolon, okay? Any logic is quite, inconsistent sometimes in whether semicolons are required or needed. Um, okay. Um, sometimes it helps you out by not requiring them, but it's it's a little bit inconsistent. Oops. I, I, I ran the, the wrong thing here. Um, sorry. Here we go. Okay. So we should be able to run this thing. Let's go run it. Okay. If I click here, what happens? Okay, what do, what do people see when they run it? Who needs TA help? Who needs TA help? TAs?
Okay. Okay. So, uh, who else needs TA help? TA help? So, what do you want me to show, Maria? Okay. Help. Is it moving? Okay, so we're going to speed it up now. How many people are ready to go forward? You want to see it move faster? So, so folks, how many people are ready to move forward? Get it go faster, okay? Okay, so folks, the next thing I'd like you to do, we're actually gonna do something um, that's probably quite new to you. So I'd like you to drag a slider. We're gonna put a slider on. We're gonna put a, a visual control on this area. So I'd like you to go, we're gonna go down in the palette to the controls area and we're going to put a slider on here, okay? This slider, slide, slide it onto there. It'll be called slider, okay? Okay, so in other words, you go down in the palette to controls and drag a slider onto, onto the top of the rectangle. It's called slider and, um, oh sorry, it'll be called velocity slider, excuse me. Let's call it velocity slider. Velocity slider, okay? It'll be used to set the velocity of the agents, okay? Okay? Okay, now I'd like you to, now I'd like you to insert this code in the, well, let's suppose we want to, let's suppose when we click on an agent, we want to not only have it move to that direction, but we want to set its velocity. Where would we do that? Sorry? Okay, so the velocity slider is there. Suppose we wanted, when we move an agent, to set its velocity according to the velocity slider. Where would we do that? On the on-click event. Just before we move it, we set its velocity. Um, and actually that will persist from then on. So how do we get to the on-click event? Okay. Um, okay, the dynamic property of this, why are we doing it on the rectangle? Because we're clicking on the rectangle and we want to put in code, we want to put in, excuse me, this code. It's basically just about the same, but we'll say dot set velocity and we'll say, this is the key thing, velocity slider dot get value. That will get the value from the velocity slider and use it to set the velocity of this person. The person's gonna be going at a certain velocity. So all this code is the same. We're asking the person who's first person in the population, okay, set your velocity according to this velocity slider, okay? The key thing here is this, this component is just like the other one, except we need to get the value. How fast should it go? And we're asking the velocity slider, hey, what value were you set to? What's your value? What's the value that someone has set the slider to? And we'll use that and we'll return a number and we'll set the velocity to that. Okay. How many people, who needs a TA that doesn't have one? Uh, it's a good question. 
uh, I, I don't know that it will make any practical difference, but I would put the set the velocity first uh, before it's setting on its way. But I think you could change it halfway through what the velocity is. And I think it'll work fine. It will just be a slight, uh, you know, infinitesimal delay and probably not material. Actually, I'd, yeah, I don't think it will materially slow it. It will make a difference. It will, okay. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't change it. Okay. Good man. Um, thank you for the information. Um, okay, so I'm going to put this code in. Um, do people want me to keep this up for longer? This this code here. Velocity slider dot get value. Okay. Okay, who needs a TA? Who needs a TA to come home with them after the boot camp? <laughs> okay, so now we should be able to click and we can we can but depending on where we click on the slider, it will go faster. Okay. If we click way over here, it will go really slow. But Kurt's... Okay. Okay. Um, question? Question? Help? Who needs a TA? Okay. Okay. So, so now we've seen um, we've we've seen people uh, move around. What I'd like to suggest is, though, we now um, right. Okay. We're we're gonna now have the agent do something more interesting. Work going towards a clicker. We're gonna add a random. We're gonna add a random walk of sorts. Okay. So, we're going to. We're going to capture for this agent that it will move in random directions. It will go towards a certain point. Once it's there, it will it will then go in a different direction. Go in a different direction. How would I do that? How would I make it so the agent is either in motion or when it ceases that motion, it will start off in a new direction? What sort of mechanisms do we have for describing behavior of agents where they transition? Okay, there will be x's and y's here. So this is sort of a, a vector of direction. But um, okay, the environment controls the agents, but now we're dealing with a particular agent's behavior. We want it to go off in a certain direction. And when it arrives at that direction, we want to set it in a new direction. What sort of mechanism have we seen already where it automatically tells us that the agent has arrived? It's a state chart. It's a state chart. A transition can fire when an agent arrives. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to build a state chart here. Um, so where does that state chart live? Does it live in Maine? It's under agent. By the way, you can have state charts in Maine. There's nothing wrong with having a state chart in Maine in general. It's just it's not going to apply to a particular agent. And it could be like a state chart for, for the overall model at some level. Um, uh, but, but now we're going to have a state chart at a person, uh, where we've seen it most commonly. So we're going to have a state chart entry point, And we're going to call that um, mobility state chart. Okay, Mobility state chart. Mobility state chart. And we're going to have exactly one state in that, and the state's going to be in motion. Okay, in motion is going to be the name of the state. And when an agent reaches to its destination, we want a transition to fire. So we need a transition that will go out of in motion, and it will do something. There'll be some action associated with it. And then it will 
it'll head it off in a, in a new direction again, go back into in motion. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to have this, this, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, transition um, go here uh, between these points. It, it's going to be kicked off and we'll undertake some action and we'll go back into in motion. So we can put it that way. In this case, I'd kind of like to, to sort of click on it and, and communicate that it's, it's, it's actually kind of uh, conceptually, it's finishing being in motion and then it's starting again. Okay, so let's suppose um, we want to set, uh, uh, we, we want to set it so that when this transition so suppose we want to catch when the person arrives at their location. How do we do that? Sorry? Yeah, agent arrival for this transition. We do agent arrival. So when it arrives at its destination, we're going to do something. What are we going to do? So, so we could um, we we could say I've arrived, but we want to set it in motion again. Now this is going to be a bit of a there's a bit of a subtlety here. Um, so when, suppose that when they arrive, we want to set them off in motion again in a random direction. Can anyone tell me how to do that? So suppose at this point when they arrive. We want to set them in motion again. How do I set this agent in motion, the current agent? I'm, I'm here for a given agent. They've just arrived. So I'm writing this for, think of it as, as applying to a given agent. What would I need to type to make it move in a different direction? Suppose I knew magically which, that I want to move it to coordinates x, comma, y. What would I write here? This dot move to, what does the this refer to? It refers to me, yeah. This dot move to x comma y, but I don't know magically those things. By the way, one of the one of the one of the nice principles of mind to keep keep things to keep in mind when you're building a model of Google and software is um, divide and conquer. Focus on one problem at a time. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Focus on one problem at a time. The problem was how do am I going to move? This is how we move. Okay, now we have the issue of where do we move to? Okay, that's a different issue. So. Where are we going to move to? Suppose we want to move to something around us, picked from around us. It's, it's, suppose it's normally distributed around our current position with some known standard deviation, say a standard deviation of, of 50. How would, I, how would I give it the x-coordinate? Suppose I knew my x-coordinate. How could I give it? draw from a normal distribution with a standard deviation of 50. What, how can I in any logic draw from a normal distribution? What do I type? Normal. That's right. Remember, move to takes two things as arguments. It takes an x and a y. So for the x location, I'll give a draw from a normal distribution. And similarly for the y distribution, I'll do a draw from what? From a normal as well. They'll be centered around different places. Okay, a normal distribution takes two, thing, two things. One is sigma, one is mean. Sigma here I'll say is 50. What's the mean? Okay, I want it to be right around me now. So it'll be centered at the current position. What's the current position? Get x. This this dot get x. Yes. Yeah, so so my current my current position is that. So this is drawing from a normal distribution with this mean my current position, and with a standard deviation of 50. And what would I do for for the second normal? Can anyone give me the code for that? What's it? It's a standard deviation of what? Say 50 also. But what what's its mean? get y, my current y position. This is just one way to put it. I could have actually done it with a standard deviation with a mean of 0 and add it to my add that sample from to my to my get y, to 
to my current get y. Okay, sorry? This dot get y, thank you, to be, to be um, sort of consistent and clear about it. So I'm just pasting it in here. This is what I put. Um, so, so in short, I'm moving to a coordinate. Which coordinate? Well, the first of them, the x coordinate, is a draw from a normal distribution centered at my current x location with a standard deviation of 50. The second, it, the y coordinate, is a draw from a normal distribution centered at my current location with a standard deviation of 50. Okay? Does that make sense? Standard deviation is the same? Well, it's, it's drawing from a, a, a normal distribution with a standard deviation that's 50. Um, I'm, I'm, the thing is that I'm moving to a randomly chosen point centered at my current location. With It's multivariate normal, so it, it uh, how much I go in the x going to go in the x direction is drawn from a normal distribution. How much I'm going to draw in a y distribution is drawn from a from a normal distribution. And it's multivariate normal centered at my current point. Does that make sense? Okay. Who who needs a TA right now? TA, TA. Okay. So let's let's go run this thing. Um. And. Something unexpected is going to probably happen. So I click. I click. Why isn't anything happening? Okay, the speed is zero. That's that's one thing. Is the agent initially moving? Are they going to arrive? Okay. So. So we should move them. Okay, so maybe we should move them initially so they can arrive, so they can start moving again. How if we put it associated with the state instead? How about when they come into the state, whether through this transition or from here, they'll start moving? What do you think? Good or not? Yeah, exactly. So, so we could put it here instead when you enter the state, whether through this or through this action, you put it, you start moving in that way. Okay, so let's, let's go do this. There we go. And look at that, folks. We'll, we'll speed it up. We have, a, we have an agent, what is it doing? What's going on, folks? Is this what you see? Okay, who needs a TA? Okay, TA is needed. Several TAs are needed. Large scale deployment. Well, we could, but, but. <laughs> We, 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 it's still, it's still sort of zoned out. Um, it's, it's, it's somewhere out there. The entry action was was that same code. We just moved that code from the. Okay, who needs who needs a TA? TA help. So we put it in the entry action to the state. So if you came in this way or you came in that way, you would uh, you'd be moving according to this. Okay.
Okay. So, so do people see this thing kind of bouncing around in a frenetic way? Sort of like that? Okay, so... Um, So, uh, so you need to lay a line down where it's moving to have a path of the spine. That's an interesting question. Um, but I don't think I'll go into that now because I'm already over time. So, um, okay. So uh, we've seen that uh, for for move uh, for motion here. Um, so now we have um, this guy kind of moving around in this way. The final um, thing we might consider was was the question back there of um, uh, suppose you wanted to bound this to the box that was given. Could we do that? Well, there is a normal distribution um, version that, that has a min and a mean um, uh, as part of it, and we could potentially use that. We could also take for the, for the um, for the x coordinate, we could take the minimum of of 500 and that, for example. Um, we could take the maximum of zero and that, and and that will bound it to be um, to be within uh, the range zero through uh, 500. And we could do the same thing with the second one if we wanted to. And now it will actually be be uh, executing it should be executing purely in the in the box here. So let's let's speed this thing up. Well, you don't you don't have to. If I can show it to you though, because uh, it yeah it's a lot of code. Um, but uh, if if you wanted to do that, you could do it with either the version of the um, of the normal distribution, or you could. Uh, uh, or I can I could put it on the screen, but this this sort of keeps it confined within the box. If you are interested in doing that, I'll put it up here on the screen. That box. Well, it would be an imperfect uh, imitation of human behavior, to say the least. The, the principle. I was just trying to show how you move things around, how you handle arrival events and get them um, moving in a different direction. So what this code is doing is it's drawing from a normal distribution. If that value is more than 500, it uses 500. If that whole value <laughs> is less than zero, it uses zero. And, and uh, same thing with, with this over here. With the log. So that keeps it in the box. Um, so you could do that. This is, this is ugly as sin. Um, so, you know, I would, if I were doing this, I would first derive the x-coordinate and then, you know, put the appropriate bounding. I'd have a function that does the clipping appropriately according to the size of the space that's currently in effect, and, and I wouldn't put the, the code there. But um, it is possible to keep it bounded as was asked. Okay. So, um, anyway, that's a bit on, on movement. What we saw here was agent mobility. Um, we can set velocities, we can move them in a certain direction based on clicks or based on random perturbations, random sort of disturbances. And, and we could, um, we can, uh, through artful sort of uh, limitations, we could keep them within some boundaries. Um, if we want to simulate human mobility, it would be an entirely different matter. Winchell back there is, is uh, uh, one of the, uh, one of the more knowledgeable people here on campus on, on the sort of human, um, human mobility pattern side and has done a lot of work with human mobility data um, and can talk with you about real models of human mobility, including things like levee walks, which are sort of fight, uh, sort of flight, flight and random water, wander models. Um, so uh, he'd be someone to consult with. But anyway, that's some of the basics of mobility. A key point here is that if we were to then scale this to be more than one agent, what do you think would happen? So if we were to take this and we were to make the population 10 agents, what would happen? Would you have to add any code? <laughs> it 
Okay, so here we go, and we can speed it up. And there's no crashing involved because uh, because there's no mutual exclusion. If we wanted to have them crash, we wanted to simulate this a collision, we would have to do something with that. We can have 100 agents here. And 100 agents would, would also be moving. We could speed this up. It looks like my, my bounding is imperfect. I just speed it up time. I'm just speeding up time. No, not by the slider. I could, I could set the set the velocity based on the slider, um, uh, but currently they don't have anything that sets the velocity before they start moving again. Um, so, so here's a random walk of that many agents. Um, I think it's actually quite a compliment to any logics uh, specification that something like this can be obtained through something that's as relatively simple as this. Here we have, you know, a fairly compact level specification of what happens at the individual level, and then you can just say, well, make a bunch of these agents and, and set them going. So we have agents moving around in space. And of course, this is at a frenetic rate that we can't really um, ca uh, we can't really know exactly how fast a given individual is is moving. But we could we could slow it down. You get more of the continuity sense of continuity here. Okay. So um, agent mobility. You tell an agent move in this direction. We used to call these sprites back when I was still young and the world was still cooling. Um, we, uh, we had things called sprites. We could just set them going in a certain direction and they would go until they reached their destination. It's a similar idea here, a similar abstraction here. You set your agent going, you don't have to worry about updating it. It takes care of updating its location until it reaches the direction. You handle, once it's reached there, what to do. So you can imagine a deer moving towards a water source. When it reaches there, it drinks, and then it moves, starts in a different direction, that sort of thing. Okay, so um, behavior, um, uh, movement behavior. You don't have to worry about step by step updating the agent unless you want them to be able to change behavior while they're moving to the um, to the destination. At yeah, you're saying if we don't, then they disperse. That's that. That's right. So they, so th there's sort of a diffusion of, of of them in a Brownian sort of way, right? So so if we were to to go here and go back to do move to um, normal and and normal here, okay. Something like this. Um, and and run it. I think what we would see is uh, so if we zoomed out. By the way, I'm zooming out through control um, mouse roll, so you can zoom in and zoom out. You can right right click and pan around. But watch this. So the gas is diffusing. Okay. So they do disperse over time. Um, it's. I think it rises with the square root of time, the sort of uh, x dispersion or y dispersion. Um, but uh, disperse they do. Um, okay. So um, that was a bit of mobility. Okay. So I think that's it for today as far as uh, lectures are concerned.